also take a moment to contemplate our motivation for this class and for today. Remembering that motivation determines what we've been studying. Meditation is the main factor. Determining whether an action, a karmic action, is positive or negative. We get in touch with our deep, uh, deep, deepest of positive Remembering just how I want to be happy and don't want to suffer. Uh, all sentient beings are the same in that way. Cultivate a kind of <clears throat> get in touch with the sense of feeling love and compassion. May I be happy. not difficult to see how there's so much uh, suffering in the world. Mm -hmm. Just take a moment to kind of contemplate and meditate on compassion. Bodhicitta is the motivation for today. Continuing to kind of contemplate compassion for the Chita, we can recite the, the verse for refuge in Bodhicitta. I go for refuge and felt enlightened to the Buddha, to the Dharma, and the Sangha, to the merits of giving and the other perfections, and I become a Buddha to the benefit of all sentient beings. I go for refuge and felt enlightened to the Buddha, to the Dharma, and the Sangha, to the merits of giving and the other perfections, and I become a Buddha to the benefit of all sentient beings. I go for refuge and from enlightenment to the Buddha, to the Dharma, and the Sangha, to the merits of giving and the other perfections, and I become a Buddha to the benefit of all sentient beings. <coughs> so we'll return to the Lamrim text. And for those who have the text, if you have the text in front of you, are on page 92. So in brief, um, in brief, we, uh, we completed uh, the section on um, the kind of process of negative karma, uh, understanding the ten non-virtues and understanding how negative karma, uh, what the effects are, the different kinds of effects and so on. And now comes the section on positive karma and its effects. 
And so, um, Amos Akaba begins this section by talking about how, um, what he's basically getting at here is right by contemplating <coughs> um, the negative as the negative effect, the negative aspects, you know, the negative things about um, about actions that harm others. Right? And there are many, many ways, we've talked about this a little bit, to contemplate how negative actions harm others, right? You can contemplate it just to remind you, right? You know, if you think of um, <coughs> You know any of the any non-virtuous action, right? like <coughs> um, sort of going off on a little bit of a tangent, but I'll just say that like um, it really is important to contemplate. You know, why would I not do that? And there are many. So again, there are many angles on that, right? Like one is um, one is that, that Ilama Sakab has covered in detail here is what are the negative karmic consequences of doing that, right? In this life. And Future lives, and, and most of went into detail, right, about rebirth in lower realms, and in the human realm, the kinds of suffering that come. So we can contemplate those kinds of effects. Um, and, you know, as a, even in this life, right, if you contemplate, like, the effects of, um, you know, obviously killing, or uh, stealing, lying, sexual misconduct, and so on. You know, if you think, de you know, oftentimes we just don't think much about that. But actually, if you think deeply about it, you can see, first of all, that, I mean, as Lama Sankapa taught, the karma of that is very heavy. But then even this life, actually, people do those things to be happy, right? And they end up being miserable. Um, right? Whether it's, um, you know, because you ruin your relationships, right? uh, you create so much, a life filled with, like, all kinds of drama, interpersonal problems, and so on, right? Um, and then also your own conscience, uh, so you end up not, not feeling at ease with yourself. Uh, and then, uh, of course, also if you point out if you've lived a negative life at the time of death, also it's like a heavy uh, burden in your conscience. Anyway, so there are many angles to think of why not to do negative actions. Right? And then um, what Lama Tsongkhapa is here is saying is if you contemplate those negative, in other words, if you don't think about it, then you just act mindlessly or something like that. But if you think about it, then what happens is you develop the wish to refrain from doing things that harm others, right? or to end things that harm yourself. Um, and so then Lama Sankaba says, uh, one way of describing positive karmic actions is, this, is simply having contemplated the faults of negative actions is, and this is important, is consciously deciding not to engage in negative. So making a conscious choice, saying, um, I don't want to be like that. I don't want to do those negative actions. And then um, when you develop that kind of motivation, and then he says, and then you carry that abstention, right, that not doing, through to conclusion, um, that in and of itself is one kind of doing positive action. You know, so for example, like, and this is important, right, I mean, as Lama Sankapa is saying here, and it, it is a very important point, because take the, you know, like, um, particularly take an example of something that you yourself, a negative action that you yourself have done at times. Right? I'll, give an, like, um, I'll give a simple example, like say um, lying through exaggeration or something like that. Right? So at one point in one's life, right, one might do that. Right? Um, and then if one contemplates the disadvantages of that, it's not that poof, it goes away. Whatever, if you have a habit of doing anything, right, uh, then th that habit doesn't go away in and of itself. Right? But if you contemplate the disadvantages and you make a decision, I'm going to abstain from that from now on. Then there come these moments where, um, let's just say, like, where the old habit is triggered, right? and you're about to do that, or you're tempted to do that, or you're heading in the direction of doing that. And that process of notice, of being aware, right? so it's an internal story, awareness, process, an internal mindfulness step, right? Where you're being mindful of the impulse as it arises, and then you're saying, oh, wait, no, that's harmful to myself, or that's harmful to others, and then you stop, right? And Lama Sankapa is saying those moments, right, 
the moment where you contemplate the disadvantages, the moments where you decide to stop a certain negative habit, and the moments where you actually do it, and then when you stay silent in that moment, right, where you would have ordinarily spoken, he's saying that's important. Right? So I mean, I'm just trying to get through what you know what, what he says here. Um, you know, having thought about their disadvantages and of carrying this abstention to its conclusion. Right, so he's talking about, that's what he's talking about. He's talking about a psychological process. But, you know, it'd be easy to just read over that and go, oh, he's defining something. But he's actually getting into a psychological process that we have to, ourselves, um, engage in. Does that make sense? And that requires, what, contemplation and introspection. And so it's not enough. I just want to, I'm going off again, well, a little bit of a tangent here. But it's not enough to just read this section on karma, right? You have to read it. I mean, you can read it or study it. But then... Um, What's really important, actually, what he's getting at here, what's really important is to apply it to oneself. Right? And so you have to kind of, we each have to, right, like, look honestly at ourselves. I like, uh, in the commentary on this chapter, Pabunker of Shea, in his commentary on this, I thought it was funny, he said, he said, don't hide your negative actions the way a cat hides poop. You know how cats cover their poop? I thought he was funny. Uh, he said, don't cover up. And what he's... And, he was getting it, and there are two types of covering up, right? One is to other people, right? Pretending I'm better than I am, right? And the other is to myself, right? Um, pretending I'm better than I am. Tomorrow, well, she was saying, don't do either one. It's not particularly helpful if you want to change, right? Because if you want to change, you have to look at your crap. Uh, like, that's, what, that's the metaphor he's getting at, right? Um, so we have to look at our faults. Um, and the only way we can progress, actually, is to look at our own mistakes, right? And to see, wow, is this harming me? Is it harming others or not? And if you can see, wow, I actually am harming myself and other people by being a particular way, um, you know, then that's the beginning of change, right? So you look at that and you say, okay, I have to be honest with myself. This is not leading me in a good direction. Um, and then, uh, you know, Lama Yeshe has that book, right? He calls it Becoming Your Own Therapist, right? That's what he's getting at. It's like you have to introspect and watch your own process and see. You know, uh, Shanti Deva says, right, although they want happiness, they destroy the causes of happiness. Although they don't want suffering, they run directly towards the causes of suffering. So that they that Shanti Deva is talking about, if I say, oh, yeah, that's those people, right? That's people of some other, anybody other than myself, that's not really helpful. <laughs> Right. What's helpful is to take Shanti Deva's advice and apply that to myself. To say, okay, in what way do I um, destroy my own happiness? In what way do I create my own suffering? Um, and what Buddhism is saying is that we do create our own suffering. Right? Um, but we don't often look at ourselves honestly enough to ask the question and analyze it deeply enough to say, how? Right? And how can I change a little bit today? Anyway, so I'm going off on a long explanation to say, so when Lama Sokaba just says that line, you know, having thought about, right, our own, uh, the faults of our own negative actions, uh, to make a decision to abstain from them and then to actually abstain from them, that's Dharma practice. Actually. You know, and Pavon Krupa, I'll just go into this, Pavon Krupa, she goes into a whole thing where he kind of says, you know, sometimes people, like, engage in very elaborate, you know, recitation of mantras and visualizations and if they're not doing this, then they're not practicing Dharma. You know, that's what he's saying. Right? It's not enough to do some kind of complicated rituals. We have to actually see what am I doing that hurts other people, right? And um, you know, and you can check for yourself, right? It's not it's like um, you know, let's sort of say this again. It's easy to say. Um, how do I say it right? It's easy to look at other people and say, "Oh, that person." You know, you look in the news and so on, right? What's hard is to look at ourselves. So that's what this is advising, is look into your own mind, right? Um, and apply that to your own body. It says here, apply this to your own body, speech, and mind. Um, then he, he said it gives a more extensive explanation. And he points out that the process of positive karma is the same as the process of creating negative karma. In the sense that there's um, a basis, meaning another... You know, you oftentimes it's another person, right? If you're going to lie, you're, who you're lying to. Um, if you're going to kill, who are you, who are you going to kill, and so on, right? Um, you know, then an attitude, right? And again, like, we don't often do that. It's to actually analyze what's... 
And what he's saying is that <clears throat> there's, a, there's a motivation, right? And the motivation behind uh, negative karmic actions is always negative, right? But the motivation behind positive karmic actions is positive, right? It may be um, compassion right? for myself or for others. It may be loving kindness. It may be some sort of, um, how do you say this, like, actually, what is that? Like, so say you recognize, well, if I do this, I'm going to hurt myself or others. And then you stop. See, that's compassion, isn't it? That's, that's being compassionate to yourself or to others. Um, so there's a whole process. And what he's getting at, again, is not, uh, you know, that you could say, take this philosophically, but it's also, it's more um, psychological. Right? It's, it's actually to watch your own process, like to see, like, and, I, and I'll say, um, I'll, I'll just share this, like, I was thinking of a, as I'm talking about it, I was thinking of some conversations, like, uh, with a friend of mine, where sons will talk about this kind of thing. And I, I always think, like, it's so, um, you know, it's like, it's one thing to say, oh, I did, like, some, I went to a Dharma class, or I went to a retreat, and that's good, but I think it's much it was more, it's much more, I say right, practical, right? When somebody's actually pointing out, like, oh, wow, when I'm in this particular kind of situation, I tend to be saying harsh things. You know, and what kind of situation is it where I say harsh things? That hurt? And the harsh things don't even have to sound harsh, but things that, what's the say? Things that make other people feel bad. So, like, where and when do I say that? Right? And then how can I change it next time I'm in that situation? Because I don't want to do that. And then you analyze it. Like, okay, it's when this, you know, if I'm in that kind of situation and then I'm stressed and then somebody says something, I tend to react this way. Right? And then you start analyzing. And that's what this is getting at. Who's the basis? There is, you know, what are the, I mean, we're going to do more detail, right? Uh, but, and what's my affliction, right? Maybe it's like I want to feel important. Like that. Maybe it's that I want to seem better than somebody else. Whatever that is, that's pride, right? So recognizing, okay, wow, in that situation I get the affliction of arrogance. And then, when somebody says something, I say something like that. You know, and sort of analyzing the whole process. That's meditation, actually, right? So you're sitting at home and you meditate. Okay, when I'm in that situation, you know, I start to feel like I want to seem important. And then that builds up in my mind. And then somebody else says something and somebody else says something. And finally, I say something um, that makes me, whatever, feel self-important and that makes other people feel bad or something. And one analyzes the process, right? And one goes, oh, wow, that's how I do it. You know, and I have this tendency to want to keep, seem important. Right? Wait, I'm giving an example. Right? There could be any delusion there. Right? And then you have to analyze it. And you have to say, okay, so next time I'm in that situation, how can I change that? Right? You actually have to imagine it. What would I do differently? You know, do I just avoid that situation? Is it too, ne is it too much for me? Would I, is it inevitable if I'm in that situation, I'll do that? Then I shouldn't go to that situation. Or is there a way of being in that situation and using that as a way of training my mind to not be that way? Um, and again, we have to be honest with ourselves, which is the truth for me, you know. You can say, oh, somebody else could go in that situation and be fine. Well, that doesn't help me, right? Like, I have to, I have to take responsibility to, like, be honest with myself. And, to say, and, like, it's hard, right? Sometimes say, wow, I can't, if I'm in that situation, I can't handle it. I'm going to be hurtful. I need to stay away then. Or, or sometimes you can say, oh, no, I could do that. I'm going to give it a try. I'm going to experiment. And when I'm in that situation, I'm going to try to be different. You know, and then uh, sometimes some of them are jokes. He says, so then if you were different for like, where before, like halfway through, you would have said something negative, and you make it three quarters of the way through, you know, then you can say, okay, well, at least that was progress. Uh, next time I'll make it perfect, you know. Um, like not to beat yourself up either, but to say, okay, I'm progressing, right? I can get better and better at this. And that that's real Dharma practice, right? Then over the course of time, you say, wow, now I can go in those situations, that situation and not do that. I have to stay vigilant, maybe, but, uh, you know, like it gets better and better, right? Um, and if you see you're not improving in a certain situation, then if you're really practicing Dharma, you avoid that situation. Right? You learn how to not go that to, to that. Does that make sense? Like, so this is very deep. I think it's a very deep point that he's getting at here. Um, and then he gives an example, right? And, and they often use killing as the example because it's, it's the first of the ten non-virtues, and it's also an easy one to explain. It's an easy basis for explaining. Right, so he points out the basis of another uh, of killing is another sentient being. The attitude is wishing to get here. The attitude, though, is not wishing to kill. It's the attitude of wishing to give up killing, right? um, having seen its disadvantages. The performance is to put effort into completely abstaining from, from killing. The completion is the action of body of correct abstention, having been completed. Right? Um, 
So at the time when you know people kill somebody, right? And then with the action, when you don't do it, that's the, you've completed the action. Um, each instance, right? Like just how each instance would be killing, yeah. Oh, you're, Jeff's getting an interesting point. One thing in the, the Lama's Recover doesn't go into here, but it's related to what you're saying, is, um, you know, there are two different versions of positive, uh, two different versions worth mentioning here that you're getting at, I think, Jeff. One is like, let's say, uh, so killing is an extreme, but I'll, I'll use the example of, uh, the one I used earlier, right? So like, say, um, I'll use the one of saying harsh things in a certain situation, right? So then if I go to that situation, where I know, okay, in the past I've gone to that situation, I've said harsh things. I've said something that made other people feel bad. And then if I go into that situation with the intention of not making anybody, of hurting anybody, and I go through the situation to the end and I haven't hurt anybody, that would be one complete karmic action of not, of not hurting, right? Um, and, that, and so then the next time I go to that situation will be another karmic action of not hurting, right? So that'd be a specific, a specific incident of a positive karmic action of restraint. Well, you were, I think another point that Jeff's hinting at, or, sort of in the I think, is that there's another way of creating positive karma too, which uh, Lama Zopram, she talks about a fair amount, so that's right. Is uh, in the example of killing, there's also a thing where a person can take a vow. Right? So if a person, say, um, so, you know, because like there are vows, like, for example, there are many vows for monks and nuns, there are vows for lay people, right? But so one of the five lay precepts, for example, is not to kill. So one thing they point out is like, if a person gets the recognition, wow, it's, it's, uh, actually, I'll use an example of um, taking intoxicants, for example, right? So if a person recognizes, wow, uh, taking intoxicants is the cause of a lot of suffering in this world, right? Like a specific, one incident, of, so let's say the person didn't take a vow, right? And then somebody offers them drug, and they say no, even though they're tempted. That's a specific incident of positive restraint. But there's another thing a person can do, which is to make a vow, right? So a person says, at a certain moment, a person says, from this moment forward, I'm not going to use drugs anymore. Right? Um, they say that uh, at that point, because of the vow itself, is, a, is in the person's continuum at that point. From that point forward, they're continually creating, as long as they're not doing the action, because of having taken a vow not to kill or not to talk to, the person's, in a sense, <coughs> the person is creating a kind of positive karmic action for the rest of that life. Right? If they say, from this moment, for the rest of this life, I'm not going to do such and such, and they keep that vow, there's a kind of um, positive karma that's accrued continually because they keep they made a commitment in their own mind, and they're keeping that commitment. Yeah, that's one. So that was what <laughs> Jeff was getting at. Not exactly, but uh, it's close enough. And you kind of did that with cigarettes. Yeah. But on the other one, on the uh, situational, if you take yourself out of the circumstance because you know that you're vulnerable, Based on the definition that you gave, you're not creating any positive karma because you're not a, the situation is not arising for you to abstain. Oh no, I think you would be like so. For take the, I'll give an example. Like so, so the example I gave, like let's say it was um, when I go to this certain party, I tend to do such and such, right? And then um, one recognizes that one recognizes, wow, I'm, I don't think I'm capable of being at that party and not doing the next. And then when somebody says, oh, you should, let's go to the party, and you say. And your motivation is, I don't want to harm people, so therefore, no, I'm not going to go. That would be the moment where you've, you've, right, you've right. done a positive act. Because that's, that's the version of restraint that person can do in that moment. But right. generally, reserve, removing yourself from the temptation or the, situ the situation, I can see the party, that's a, that's a discreet uh, instance. Or take the example, let's I'll give driving, it. Let's say driving. continual chances, opportunities. Right. Yeah, I guess though it's interesting. I don't know. I mean again one has to figure out for oneself I mean ultimately. But I think there is like like take the example with in your example of driving, right? Like um let's sort of say this. There would still have to be some combination, right? Like on a given day I might say, okay, I'm going to try to be patient today while I drive. 
but then there might be a time where like um, let's just say this like where one recognizes okay it's like let's just say it, it's like okay like it's um Fourth uh, of July downtown uh, in Washington you know like okay I'm not gonna like recognizing I'm not that good at being patient it's fourth of July I'm not going downtown today. Uh, and that would be an example of if one recognized because I'll get angry or something I'll get frustrated like that would be an example of the other, you know, and saying, okay, in general, like today, like on one day, one might say, okay, I'm going to try to be patient. But then on the 4th of July, at, you know, whatever, 6 o'clock at night, you know, someone will say, I'm not driving that down because I'll probably get mad at people and honk and be rude. So I'm not going to, and then restraint. So it would be a combination of both still, I think. I'm just saying on a practical level. Mm -hmm. In terms of the harsh speech, Yeah, if you think about it from the, I mean, if you think from the point of view of um, these teachings, right, on karma, you've successfully, well, two things you've accomplished, actually. You know, one is you didn't hurt, hurt this guy as much, probably. You may have still showed it on your face, but it was better than saying right, it. Right, right, right. Um, and the second, though, is that you you protected yourself from one of the ten non-virtuous acts, right, harsh speech, in that case, let's say. Anyway, so you improved. Like, so let's say before you had both uh, ill will and harsh speech. So you can say, okay, well, now I've eliminated the hard speech. I still have ill will. Um, and then it would be like, okay, now how do I work on the ill will? That's the next step. But oftentimes you have to, you know, that's why, like, and again, if you look at the teaching on um, the ten non-virtues, we said that at one point, like, that if you look, like, it goes from the most extreme with killing, right, down to the mental ones. And in a sense, for a reason, right, that it's, there is, if somebody has hatred for somebody, um, they would say it's, it's much easier to restrain your body from killing the person than it is to restrain your mind from feeling anger, let's say, or hatred for the person. Um, but so the first step is that, in a way, is to stop our, first is to stop our body in a way, then is to stop our, from hurting other people, then is to stop our speech from hurting other people, and then finally to transform one's mind into something uh, non-violent or kind. Or so. so that's definitely progress. You know, uh, but it, one isn't done. <laughs> you know, but, but that's definitely progress. Does that make sense? Like, yeah, yeah. And we should give ourselves credit for that progress, actually. You know, like, because um, that's how one trains. You know, so it's a gradual process of training. You know? So, at first, you would punch the person and tell them they're terrible and and be angry. You know, and then you stop punching them, but you still say things, and then eventually you stop saying. You know, that is progress, actually. Does that make sense? Or you'd like to be able to get rid of all of them? Well, I mean, I mean, I say that because I've experienced that, and then, but I still walk away feeling um, upset with myself that that I allowed myself to hear, you know, because I made the intent that I was not going to do that, and yet when I got into the situation, I was able to keep my mouth shut. Say my own my own thought on it. If you don't know, okay. uh, this is not, I'm not sure what. Not, I'll, I'll just say my own thought for what it's worth. Is I, I think that is progress. First of all, so I think it's important to stop and say, okay, that was good. <laughs> you know, at least I didn't say it. But then, like, I think the process of changing the thoughts, right, the, the mental, the mind, is also gradual. I'll, I'll use it in your example because I like it. Is to say, like, I think the next. <laughs> I'll just say my, my own example, my own process. If I were in that, too, is that probably my next step, honestly, would be, well, they're a jerk, but not a total jerk. <laughs> like, you know, like there is nobody's a total jerk. Um, even the worst people are have some good qualities. and like So actually, like, you know what I mean? Like, so you start to say, because actually the problem with it, if you look at the psychology of anger, which Buddhism teaches, is that it exaggerates the negative, right? When we're angry, we can't see the positive in the other, and we start. So in other words, like, because if you just say, don't say, don't think the person's a total jerk, right? that actually doesn't work in my experience. Like, what does work from, in my own experience would be, because it gets at the underlying theme of anger, which is the exaggeration, would be to start going, okay, now I'm not saying anything, I still think they're a total jerk, so my next task is to see, you know, well, they're acting bad or like a jerk in this moment, but they have good qualities, and can I hold both? 
in my mind, or remember the good qualities, even when I'm thinking very sure. And like, I'm just getting at that, like, it's almost like, um, it's like chipping away at the attitude of anger or something like that, right? And then starting to say, okay, what are their good qualities? And in what way are they helpful? And, you know, and then of course you want to eventually get to Shanti Devas, right? Where like, actually this, this person's the most precious one, or, or the eight verses of mind training, right? Eventually one comes to a point where, you think where one feels, oh, they're the most precious, most helpful, most kind, right? better than, you know, they're, they're my teacher, right? Like the eight verses of mind training says, so you view them as your guru, that person. Right, but you can't immediately, if you can't immediately get there, which usually you can, one can sort of start moving in that direction by, I would work on the word total, for example. That's a, that, just in your exact, because I've had that thought with somebody in the past, and then to start working, okay, total, that means I'm exaggerating. How am I exaggerating? Like, how is my mind doing that, and why is it doing that? And is there something about this person that makes me want to exaggerate, tend to exaggerate about them as compared to somebody else, and so on? You know, and, and slowly one changes. But I think it's a gradual process. And so I guess my main point though is that it's always a gradual process, and um, and if one can't give oneself credit for making the gradual pro progress, then I won't sort of give it up. I think. But another key there is to give yourself the mental space to do that analysis. So, like in my anger example, the way I always approached it was <clears throat> first try to see the anger when it was going to arise. If I knew that there was a situation that was going to in the past caused me to get angry, if I tried to catch it before it actually came to fruition, then I was able to, well, I was able to stop being angry, actually. Um, but you need space to do that. You need to be able to see it coming before you, uh, you're already in it, right? Yeah, and I think that's the one good thing about sort of bad incidents or something, or act incidents where one makes a mistake, is that they provide the, the sort you know, I work as a psychologist, oftentimes when somebody says, oh, I had a bad week, I think, oh good, that's something to work on. You know, it's like, but the same for oneself. It's like, oh, if I made, you know, if I had a bad day, good, like, that's where I can learn, you know, like. More money for me. But, yeah, it's good to think of when we make mistakes, though. Because that's how we learn, yeah. Okay, and then the next point Lama Tsongkhapa makes is he says, um, okay, he, he's going to get the, the, the effects of positive actions. And so, you know, earlier he, he pointed out that the, among the effects of negative actions is rebirth in the three lower realms. And so here he's saying um, the fully ripened effect, he calls it, uh, of positive actions is rebirth in one of the three higher realms, right? So. Um, he particularly actually, he, that's interesting. Here he, he doesn't mention actually the demigod or anti-god or Ashura realm. He, talk, he specifically talks about uh, the human realm, the desire realm, and the uh, two upper realms. So the two upper realm gods, what he's referring to is they're among the god realms, there are the desire realm gods, the form, and the two upper, he's saying form and formless realm. Um, and so he's talking about those are the different kinds, he's giving those as examples of, of the effects of, the fully ripened effects of positive action. Um, and what he's pointing out there is that um, he's actually saying that uh, smaller positive actions lead to human rebirth, uh, medium ones lead to desire realm God, and, and uh, big ones lead to rebirth in the, uh, this form and formless realm God. Actually, the um, really the form and formless realm God realms are um, the karma to be reborn there has to, at least according to all the teachers I've read, and actually the commentary said this, has to involve um, meditation on those realms. Like, so somebody who's already achieved calm abiding and who meditates on um, form, form absorptions and formless absorptions will take rebirth in those realms. So that's the cause of that. I mean, that's the main cause of that. Uh, so those are the cause of that. But the causes of desire realm, God rebirths, are, um, you know, like, uh, so, so they talk about, for example, um, Actually, you know, like the uh, sometimes they call the the, what's it called? the four immeasurables, right? There's a meditation on immeasurable love, uh, you know, equanimity, love, compassion, um, and joy, a sympathetic joy. Sometimes they call those the Brahma Viharas, right? The sort of like the um, and the reason the reason for that is that they say by meditating on 
uh, love for all beings in a given in the universe, the karmic result can be rebirth as Brahma, you know, so a God who is a desire of God according to uh, Buddhism. Uh, so that's an example of uh, what they're talking about, like a great, uh, you know, a me an intermediate virtue is actually meditating on love for all beings in the universe. Um, of course, to become a Buddha, one meditates for all, uh, uh, what's it, love for all beings, you know, uh, all sentient beings, right? But um, not with the motivation of becoming a god, but with the motivation of uh, becoming a Buddha. Um, and then it gives another point about the effects of positive actions that I want to mention. It says, um, here it just says the effect in conformity with the cause and the conditioning effect are the opposites of those from the negative. What that's getting at is this, is an important point actually, is it's saying um, the main result, right, the, the sort of ripened result, which means like the, the main result of a, of a positive action is a good rebirth. But then it's saying there are other kinds of results, and it's giving two examples, so I'll mention what they are. Uh, the effect in conformity with the cause, that means like, so if you're a human being, right, again, uh, but it's saying that um, the effects in a sort of, in the context of your life are similar, are in conformity with the cause. What that mean? I'll give a couple of examples of what that means. You know, the effect, like we said earlier, the effect in conformity with the cause of killing would be a short life. So the effect in conformity with the cause of not killing would be a long life. So they're saying here, if you don't harm others, one of the karmic effects of that is you'll live long and not be healthy. Um, the effect of not, you know, of, for example, of not stealing from others and of being generous to others is abundance and so on. So that, that's that kind of effect. Does that make sense? And then the other one, the conditioning effect, what that means is um, the tendency to do it again. Right? And so they often talk about this in the sense that, um, <clears throat> actually, you can see that in children. So in other words, some, some children and some, some people have a natural inclination towards certain negative or positive actions, and others don't. Um, and so what that's saying is that's the effect of having, done, of having trained in a past life. Right? So, you know, we gave, and when we went over this, we gave negative examples, right? Somebody who naturally likes killing or who is, who's, who's born with a tendency towards addiction, or born with a tendency towards rage or something. Here what it's getting at is you can look at a person's, at your own and other people's uh, positive habits, natural, what comes naturally, and recognize that must be due to familiarity with training in a past life. Right? So if, you, if, you know, if you're naturally generous, you know, uh, that would suggest you're generous in a past life. You know, and you see that, right? You see in some children, this, like, when they see somebody suffering, they immediately want to help them, the animal. And, uh, you know, that, that, and that suggests a training of compassion in past life. Um, and so on. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Any questions about that before I go on to the next part? The next part, um, it, it, this is getting, it, it's called, talking about uh, indica uh, indicating other classifications of so it's just getting into some details about how karma works. And um, one point that it gets to here now is what's called in the text throwing karma and completing karma. Um, and so I <laughs> think it's an interesting word, throwing karma. Like, you know, like throwing a ball. Like um, what it's saying is that uh, some, uh, like one kind of karmic result or karma, one kind of process in karma is when the action throws us to a particular rebirth. That's what that's getting, that's the, metaphor there. Right, so one kind of karmic, uh, one kind of positive karmic result is that it throws one into a good rebirth. Um, you know, one kind of result of negative action is it throws one into a bad rebirth. Right? Um, then the other kind is completing karma. So the completing karma is what sort of um, fills in the details of that life. Um, and this will become clear. It gives an, it gives four al four sort of alternatives, right? One is the projecting karma is virtuous, and the completing karma is virtuous, right? So that would be say they give the example there of a human being, right? So that's a virtuous throwing karma because you're human. Um, 
you know, who then lives in a place, for example, where there's relative peace, is in a family that gets along fairly well, has enough resources uh, to live fairly comfortably, has a good, you know, has the access to a good education, and so on. That would be an example where the person has a, there's a positive throwing karma that creates a positive rebirth, and then positive completing. Then they give the example of positive throwing karma, but ne uh, negative, non-virtuous, completing karma. And so the example that's often given there is uh, where the person has the human rebirth, right? but that is, is born in a place where, um, this is, you know, where there's, say, extreme poverty and war. Right? Um, and so, uh, you know, it's a good thing that they were born human, obviously, right? But in other words, but if, if your main experience of life is conflict, so we're never having enough, and, and um, you know, uh, continual danger, and so on. Uh, that would be an example where the, the, the overall karma that through the, the that created that life is positive, but the completing karma is uh, negative. Then it says the projecting karma is negative, but or uh, the throwing karma rather is um, non-virtuous, but the completing karma is virtuous. Um, the ex an example of that would be uh, pets in the U.S. Not everybody's, but many pets in the U.S. have like, a, you know, there is it's an animal rebirth, but the circumstances they have are often uh, better than, you know, so some of the some people's pets have better circumstances than many humans have. But, um, <laughs> uh, that happens occasionally. Sometimes members of the center, uh, but. Um, and then the. Uh, a non-virtuous throwing karma and a non-virtuous completing karma. Um, actually, it makes me just what popped in my head is the opposite. Like I was thinking, actually, I thought of. Um, I may remember when I was traveling in India one time, seeing the situation of the dogs there. Right? So that there was um, where they were starving and sort of, you know, if, they, if somebody walked too close, out, sort of like kids would kick. You know, so kids like, and they were like homeless dogs that were starving. And people would just like kick them or throw things at them. Right, so the, the, both the rebirth is negative, is suffering is a, in the lower realm, but also the uh, the details of that life are also more harsh. Um, and so it's just talking about that there are different kinds of karmic results that come from the actions we do. And so if we do positive actions, they lead to you know the idea is to create positive throwing karma, so you have a good rebirth, and also positive completing karma, so you have positive experiences. Um, Again, this is, we're just going through some different classifications of karma. So the next one, <laughs> the next classification is there's karma that will definitely be experienced and karma that will not definitely be experienced. Um, and so what it says here is what will definitely be experienced is that which was done intentionally and accumulated. Um, what will not definitely be experienced is what was not done intentionally and therefore has not been I'll, I'll go into a little more detail, I'll just go a little further. The difference between what has been done and accumulated is as follows. So what it's getting at here is, um, you know, if you, uh, if, if any of us, right, if we, with clear intention, plan to do a thing and then do it, uh, that's a, com we called it a complete karma, where the action was done and it was an accumulated karma, and then that will, and what he's saying here is that will lead to a result. Then there are actions that are not. Um, I'll give an example of an action that uh, he give, well he gives an example here actually. He says uh, one kind of action that's uh, done but not accumulated is the action done in a dream, right? So there's, so he's giving an example there where one did in a dream one did something but it was just a dream so one didn't accumulate that karma, right? So so he's, he's saying if you kill somebody in a dream that's not there's not another per if you go back to the the whole detail of how karma functions, right? There has to be a basis. Uh, there's no basis because it's, it's just a dream. Right? So that wouldn't be a complete, uh, that wouldn't be a karma that was accumulated. Um, other examples in the commentary he gave is like if, if a person um, is out for a walk and, and it isn't, isn't looking down and steps on an ant, right? They did do an action of killing an ant, but it wasn't accumulated because they didn't, there was no intention there and the person isn't, may not even be aware they did it. Uh, for example. That's different than if the person sees an ant and goes and stomps on it. Tension, but this is saying like 
if you do something without intending to do it, um, you've done an action, but it's not accumulated. Not accumulated. Yeah, you didn't accumulate a karma. Right. Uh, and so those are actions that are not definite. There is the action that you did a particular thing, but there's no definite result of that. <clears throat> so is that the same that, so like, you killed some someone in an accident? Would that be the same thing? Yeah. Yeah, because there was no intention. So you did. So you did an action, but it's not definite. That what he's saying here is that he would call that um, it is not definite to experience a result because there was the factor of intention. What if take Gabe's example? What if you were speeding like tremendously and you knew that was dangerous, but you did it anyway? But you weren't trying to kill anyone. That's interesting, right? I mean. Uh, You know, going back is like if you look at the karma of um, like so. Do I have a, it, what, what you would say is it's not a complete karma of killing, right? If we go back to the, the teaching on killing, right? Because with for a complete karma of killing, there has to be a recognition of another person, of, of an animal or a person or another sentient being. Uh, you know, an afflictive emotion, a wish uh, to kill, and that well, the first has to be an afflictive emotion, say anger or something, and then there has to be an actual wish to kill, right? Uh, which is the motivation, which is different than the affliction. And so it doesn't have to be the complete action. And the affliction has to be towards the basis. Like, what if you're just angry, so you're exploring it, <laughs> shooting down the highway? You see, well, that's what you're getting at, though. So then it would, it would be a different negative mm -hmm. process, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas in that case, it wouldn't be that, because to have a complete karma of killing, you would, have to have, you would have to have the basis first. You'd have to have a yeah. clear basis. Yeah. So that might be, what would that be? I mean, there would still be an afflictive emotion, and there would still be um, a negative action. What's that? Ignorance. Yeah, it might be ignorance, or I mean, it could be anger. I guess or a person was very angry and therefore was speeding, or a person could be ignorant, not thinking, you know, not, um, you know, and, and and if in the back of one's mind, one knew one was putting others at risk, which but you would at that point, um, you know. So so I mean, I don't know. I'm not sure how to classify it. It would be. Um, it would certainly be a negative action, but it, it wouldn't be a complete negative action of killing. So I guess that's how you would have to. Yeah, uh, the key point is intention and motivation. You know, like, is, is, it the, is there an afflictive emotion there, and then what's one's intention? Um, but the negative karma of knowingly speeding and not hitting anybody and not killing anybody is already a negative action there. They're just by disregarding the danger you're putting others into, right? That's a negative karma. But if that action also leads to somebody's death, those are completely different levels. Depends on why we, you were speeding too. Just the mere act of speeding is not. You could be speeding because uh, trying to save someone's life. You went to the hospital. That's your intention. But then you got in an accident and you kill somebody else. Yeah. So, so you're saying it depends on the motivation, which is true. Right? In other words, um, for positive and negative karmic actions, it depends on the motivation. It's definitely true. Can you define accumulation? Here, I guess what they're, here it's, I mean, in this section at least, when Lama Sankapa is saying, um, actually he says it here, that which was, a, basically what he, I mean, he actually doesn't phrase it very well. Yeah, actually what he's saying here is, a karma that's accumulated is, a, is, a car, is an action that is done intentionally, and therefore will bring a result. So that's an accumulate, like we're accumulating karma when we do something intentionally, and therefore, you know, in other words, if we do an action intentionally that will, and that by its very nature, action is done with intention will bring results, that's an accumulated karma. And he's differentiating that from actions done in dreams, for example, or actions done not intentionally, which are not accumulated karma. So, let's say that I'm, 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 I'm
I'd say it's not our habit to steal. So when we're walking around and we see, I don't know, we're walking in the suburbs and people have bicycles and porch furniture, <laughs> maybe a flat of flowers they didn't plant yet, <coughs> and we just sort of naturally don't stop and take those things, is that just neutral? Like, do we have to be walking there saying, I'm not going to steal in order for that to be positive? Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, we just by nature don't take other people's things. It's From a karmic point of view, like, uh, in terms of what Lama Tsongkhapa is saying here, uh, well, two things. One is that would be a result of a past positive habit of not stealing. So in that sense, it's the result actually of a positive karma. Um, it's you know it's that what was it called the uh, we just went over that you know that, that, yeah. that kind of karmic result. But f really, yeah, he is what it is saying here is there has to be intention. And so I want to differentiate. This is why actually this is an important point what you're getting at. This is what Lama Lama Zobrimshe says this actually his advice to people is he says, you know, if you have that tendency, like if your tendency is to not steal anyway, what he says is that, um, you know, if you just go for a walk like that. You're not, it was because there's no intention to steal or not steal, you're not actually creating fresh, positive karma. Whereas, it, what, that's what, that was, you know, what, my answer to Jeff's point earlier, Lama Zobrimshe says, so if you're skillful, actually, it's a skillful way of, of working with our own karmic process, I guess, is he says, that's one of the benefits of taking vows. So if you make a, if you take, you know, if you're, if, let's say you take, uh, that's one of the five lay vows, if you take a vow, saying, from this moment forward, I'll never steal. He says, then, because there was intention, then you are creating positive uh, karma by not stealing. Whereas if you didn't make a vow, it's just sort of a neutral. So in another life, that all that positive karma that we earned that's making us not steal could be used up and we become a thief if we don't make more positive karma in that direction. I guess so. It's sort of, yeah, you're not creating as powerful a... Actually, I'll, I'll just make a comment too. Like, I, actually, I think that's true. And I'll just make a comment, like from my own reflection on that, is I think there's some truth to that actually. Because, like, let's just say this. Like, you know, actually, if you look at people, I mean, I believe that's true over the course of lifetimes, actually, from the karmic teachings. But also, I'll, I'll just say, like, if you look at somebody, like, actually, well, I'll, I'll share my own example. Like, I remember when I was in very, when I was in my twenties, I took some precepts like that from the Dalai, as well as the Dalai Lama was giving them a teaching, and, taking them. and I thought, oh, I don't tend to do that anyway, you know, like, so it's easy, you know, but I was very young, I didn't know much, you know, like, yet. Yeah. and then um, over the course of my life, there came moments where it was like, oh, wow, this, I was like, I would realize, oh, this is the moment where I would have done that if I hadn't taken a vow, and when I was 21 or whatever I was, I don't know, and I, I don't remember the exact age, but around there, like, I would never would have occurred to me that that I would do that action or something. But by taking the vow, it built up, like, you know, because then I remember thinking that. I was like, I was like, well, I've kept that vow for eight years now or ten years now or something. You know, I took it from the Dalai Lama. And, like, you know, so I don't care if I would have done that. I'm not going to do it now because there's some power, uh, both to having taken a vow and also to having kept it for a period of time. And so if that can happen, I can say from my own experience, if that can happen in one life, for sure that can happen over the course of, right, like, um, you know, and like the same thing, right, like, in other words, um, take your example of stealing, right, like, so you may not steal or something, but then if you were born in a different circumstance, right, around people who are stealing all around you in your next life, let's say you're yeah. human and you're born, you know, like, that's where I think the difference, you know, like, where one person might say, oh, I'm not really comfortable, and their friend says, you know, like a kid, I'm saying, where they don't, they're not thinking, right? And their friend says, come on, that'll be fun, and, I'm, you know, and the person just goes along, and then they start getting in a habit, and then gradually it becomes their norm. Whereas somebody else, like, what is that that makes a person say, no, it's not just not who I am, I don't care, like, even when there's peer pressure, or even when there's, right. and it seems that like what this is saying is, is what you're saying, that that's one of those things that is a subtle karmic tendency or something. So there is a power. Oh, yeah. Right? Like the awareness that says, I'm bound not to. Yeah. 
And there's still a power in that. There's also a power in taking vows for specific periods of time. Yeah, yeah. There's the one day precepts and things like that. But I won't do this for a week. This, you yeah. know, you take a vow not to do this for a week. Yep. And then the next point, again, this is just going through details about karma. Uh, Lama Sukhapa says, um, in terms of uh, karma that is accumulated, right, and therefore will bring a result, he says, um, basically there are different time frames in which the result can or will be experienced. Um, and, uh, and so basically he gives three, he says there are three different time frames. One is in this every life. The next is out just you know just after death and your your next rebirth, and the third is after a series of rebirths, you know which could be thousands or millions of lifetimes in the future. Uh, but he says at least at least uh, two away, two or more uh, away. And um, and one thing that the uh, the commentary actually Bonker Bache in his commentary to this says, especially on the first one, uh, the karmas that will be experienced in this life. Um, or in the immediate next life, usually those are particularly powerful karmas. And so, um, for the one, for the, the, the typical example of a, ne of a negative karma that will be experienced in the next life, is what they call the fi uh, five uninterrupted negative mis or misdeeds or something like that. And this is like killing one's parents or killing, you know, killing an arhat or causing a division in the sangha and so on. Um, and so it's saying those are such heavy negative karmas that their uh, experience in the immediate next life. But Pabonkar Rinpoche actually gives a positive example. And he says, um, he gives a positive example of the first one in his commentary, where he talks about th those that will be experienced in this life. And, uh, and part of what he's getting at is he's saying, um, you know, if you do, if you make, if, you're, if you work, if you work very hard at practicing uh, Dharma, you know, it is if you put sincere effort into studying, contemplating, and meditating, then even though, let's just say, then the realizations and so on can happen in this very lifetime, is that some people even become a Buddha in one life. And he says that's the result of extremely powerful positive karma, right? Where it might have ordinarily taken them much longer, <coughs> but they gain some kind of powerful realizations or even enlightenment itself in this life. And he says that's the result because it's a powerful and positive karma. It can, it can ripen sooner. And so... Um, yeah, so the more powerful the, there is, these kind of extremely powerful karmas are more, whether positive or negative, are more likely to ripen sooner. Um, so, you want another question? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. So, throwing karma then means what? Throwing karma means the karma that leads to an entire rebirth. So, by, by definition, it's a heavier, it's a more powerful karma? I think part of this is like, uh, that's not clear to me if it has to be, because I think sometimes completing karmas can also be powerful, or sometimes they can, like, I think the issue is that, uh, my understanding at least, if I remember correctly, is that a throwing karma, or, a, or a, you know, a karma that creates a rebirth, has to be a complete action, I think. Like, you know, so it has to be, have an intention, and, um, you know, and have a basis, and, and be, like, so it has to have been a complete a, a complete karma that was fully accumulated. Whereas sometimes, like, um, I think the completing karmas can be, can be fully, uh, but they can also be, let's just say this, like karma, I think they can also be karmas that, um, you know, we gave examples when we were talking about karma, like where um, a person intended to do one negative action, but, you know, like they, they thought they were stealing from one person, but they actually stole from somebody else, or they they thought they were, you know, like, so, let's just say this, Karmas that were incomplete, but were still negative or positive. Uh, I think my understanding is that those usually lead to um, complete. Uh, what's it called? Um, what's the word he says it? Uh, more environmental or detailed results than the throwing throwing to an entire rebirth. I think that's true. So there are completed karmas. There are incompleted karmas that still result. Effects, yeah. They're just less powerful. 
a complete car, like a carpet that was done with full recognition of the basis and a complete motivation. And Now, uh, Lama Sakaba gets into a, a new, a, 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 another topic related to positive karma still. So what he says is, um, I'll just read this one line. He says, through abandoning the ten non-virtuous actions, you do indeed attain a good basis. So he's saying you'll get a good rebirth if you refrain from the ten non-virtuous actions. Then he says, however, if you achieve a fully qualified basis for accomplishing omniscience, it will be quite unlike others with respect to covering ground in your meditation on the path. Therefore, you should attain <coughs> that basis. And so what he's saying here is, um, in general, right, if you avoid the ten non-virtuous actions and you do positive karma in that sense, you create positive karma in that sense, it can protect you from falling to lower realms, you can have a good rebirth. Then he's saying, but if you want to progress on the path to enlightenment, that's not, um, that's not, what's the word, ideal. Because, and we know this from experience, actually, it's not so easy to progress along the path to enlightenment, right? And so he's saying um, there are particular qualities of a kind of human rebirth um, that allow one to more effectively progress on the path, of, on the, uh, covering ground in your meditation on the path. Um, and so then he gets into what are, he, get, he lists eight fully ripened positive qualities and their functions. And then he describes how to create those eight qualities. Um, so he gets into um, yeah, eight qualities of a human rebirth that make it easier to uh, progress on the path. So I'll go through those eight because he does. You know, so the first one is excellent lifespan. Um, and what that's getting at, of course, is that um, even if you say, so say you become a human being, right? Um, you take rebirth as a human and you want to practice Dharma. Uh, of course, having a long life is much more advantageous than having a short life. Um, and especially with Dharma, actually, if you notice, like, you know this, I mean, anybody who's made effort in studying and practicing uh, Buddhism, is, uh, is, is, is it takes a fair amount of time, right, to learn the stuff. Um, and then to practice, you know, like to make progress on the path takes time, right? So first you have to learn something, then it takes time to, pr to like to contemplate it, to understand it, then to put it into practice. Um, and so, for sure, this is true, right? Having a longer lifespan is very helpful. Um, and so, uh, and so, what he says here, Lama Sokapa says, um, you know, in order, in order to under, undertake positive actions for the welfare of yourself and for others, having a longer life is more helpful. Also, in order to create virtue, having more time to do so is helpful. Uh, so that's pretty straightforward. Right? So the first quality is having a long life, and, and the reason for that is it gives you more time to practice, gives you more time to help others. It gives more time having learned something to put it into practice and so on. Uh, the second one, I don't know, this translation's a little funny, which says ex excellent complexion, but it's not really about your complexion. What it's, what it's getting at is... Um, essentially having a pleasing form. So what it's saying is, um, actually it's quite true in all cultures, right? In other words, if you're, um, what it's saying is uh, if you're a human being, um, you know, having uh, a pleasing form, having complete sense powers, um, essentially being, uh, here it says, uh, you know, being pleasing to, being uh, having a pleasing aspect or something like that. So it's both having a body that functions properly or well, and that's pleasing is, an ad, is advantageous in the human realm. Uh, so it's saying that's the second quality. And it's saying the, re, uh, the reason why is people, uh, he, sa it's interesting. he says here, the reason why is people will then listen to your words. So that's, that's uh, his point there. The third one is um, here called excellent, he, again, some of these translations of terms are, I think are just in English are difficult. It says excellent extraction. Uh, other translations say it more like um, coming from a excellent or noble lineage or noble family. And so what that's getting at is coming from a, um, whereas if, you, if, if you're taking a human, if you're going to be in the human realm, it's more advantageous to come from a, 
a family is well respected and sort of what's the word? Well, noble in two sense. Not noble in the. I mean, it's not like a. In this sense, noble. What it says here is uh, respected. Um, and uh, the example they often give of this is uh, Shakyamuni Buddha. Right? He was born in, in a family of a kind of. Uh, in his case, it wasn't really. Um, they say king, but actually, it wasn't like a king in the sense of. Um, it wasn't the king of all India. It was a king. It was a regional king. Right? But he, in other words, he was born into a family. Well, actually, if you think about it from this point of view, what's part of what it's getting at is you have more access to education, you have more access to uh, resources. I was actually, re recently I was reading a biography of um, one of his only Dalai Lama's teachers, Dilgo Kensi Rinpoche. And it struck me as an example. He was born into a kind of a very a noble family in a certain area. Not noble, like noble in the sense of like, you know, fairly well off and respected. And you can see how like he wanted to study Dharma. And it was like because he was from that family, he had resources so he could go to places and go to class, and then also people were happy to, you know, sort of like, oh, I know your dad, yeah, come, you know, you're welcome, and or, you know, I know your mom, you know, you know, come on into, you know, come on and you can stay here. Uh, it wasn't difficult for him to receive many, many teachings as a young person, and then later he practiced them quite intensively, and then became a famous teacher. So like that, you know, coming from, like, having a situation where you can then uh, do things, um, get things done, or something like that. Um, Excellent power. Uh, here they're talking about, um, it says it here, right? Uh, having resources and friends and followers. Um, and due to this, you can gather other sentient beings around you and, and help them. Um, next one is uh, either, here they call it respectable words. You could also call it trustworthy. Um, and what it's saying is, uh, this is going to get, actually it's true, right? Some people, like, What's this? Some people want to have a certain something about them, right? A certain demeanor, where when they speak, people respect what they're saying or trust them or listen, and other people um, don't have that experience, right? And have you ever like I've, you've probably heard people like somebody says, you know, like the opposite of that is like you know sometimes people say, oh, I was in a meeting and I said this idea five times and nobody listened, and then so and so said it, and everybody was like, oh, what a great idea. <laughs> um, that would be the opposite of this, right? Um, and that can also happen in families, right? Like, whereas you say something over and over and over, like, why don't we, you know, why don't we do it this way? Why, why, it would be so much better. And everybody kind of ignores, and then, so, and then, like, maybe later somebody else says, oh, wow, that's really, you know. And like, <laughs> um, so that's a karma, is what this is getting at. And it's better to have the karma where people do listen to what you say. Uh, it's more, first of all, it's more pleasant experience. Uh, but also, um, as a teacher, you know, in other words, what it's getting at here is also if somebody wants to, eventually become a Dharma teacher, having that quality where people respect your words is very helpful, otherwise people won't listen. Um, next one, it says, is um, renowned for being very powerful. So it says, doing, uh, due to possessing positive qualities such as diligence and generosity and so forth, you become an object of veneration of great beings. Uh, due to this, they help you with all your activities, whereby you accomplish deeds uh, and quickly, and uh, others quickly heed your commands. Right, um, and this one actually, right? So being renowned is very powerful. In, in this sense, it's not powerful. It, what, powerful here really means like, let's say this, like part of what this is getting at is like. Um, you know, if you look, particularly in the Buddhist context, if you look at, like, there are some people who, like, because they're so diligent and they work really hard at their practice, um, like, for example, like, teacher, Buddhist teachers, lamas, and so on, what's their say? It's like, you actually can see what, like, what's there, I'm trying to think of the example, like, take Lama Zopram Shay as an example, right? There is he so fully and deeply fulfills the advice of all of his teachers then teachers are happy to help him and give him more teachings and pass transmissions on to him and so on. Um, so it's like, he's, he'd be an example of this quality, like somebody who's, who's sort of powerful in being able to bring things to completion and powerful in the ability to sort of make things happen um, in a positive way in the world. So first of all, then, actually, uh, you know, actually if you look in, in, the, in the Buddhist, actually if you, if you sort of, in all different lineages, I've noticed this, that like, Lamas are quite good at sort of noting people who 
do that and encouraging them, right? Because it's a way of helping the world more. Uh, so that's what this is getting. Uh, the next one I think is uh, actually even the co I'm not just me. The commentaries also get the same point. I would say it says being male, and and His uh, Holiness the Dalai Lama and other the other commentators say that's culturally specific to the time period around the Buddhist time in India. So it's saying that uh, in that time period it was very difficult. For, um, in that cultural context, it was difficult for women to have freedom to practice and to study and to travel freely. Uh, and so, actually, it's only as Dalai Lama points out, in his commentary on this, he points out, he actually says, um, uh, according to Hayashi Yoga Tantra, it's actually more advantageous to be a woman. That's what the Dalai Lama said. So he kind of, he, uh, that was his point on this one. Um, but he did actually say one other thing. He said, um, he said, actually, cultural context is important. And he gave an example, which I thought was intriguing. It's not about gender in this case, but he says, he pointed out, he said, you know, Shakyamuni Buddha was born into the warrior caste in India. And he says, whereas Maitreya will be born into, they predict, the Buddha himself said, Maitreya will be born as a Brahmin in India. And he says, um, he says, because Bodhisattvas, uh, what's this is, when they're trying to help others, do, let's just say this, take into account what's happening in the culture and the time period. And he, was, and he says, so, you know, at that particular time when Maitreya comes, the prediction is that Brahmins will be more, have more influence on others, and so be more advantageous to others than the rebirth of the Brahmin. So he only says, so this is sort of, so he's, he, give me, he gives that example where he says it's specific to a time and a cultural context. So that's what his only says about that. But I'll, I'll stick with that. Um, and then the last one, the last one is an interesting one. It's called, they call it possessing strength. And one commentary, and also Lama Zorba, she says this, uh, they give the example of Milarepa in this one. It's like, let's just say this. Here it says, uh, naturally only few harms and no diseases, uh, whereupon great enthusiasm arises. It's like, th that one is like, um, I, I, sometimes, like, I sometimes think of that as resilience or as strength, or as, but it's like some quality that's actually f partly physiological that some people have where they can like, let's just say this, they can weather difficulties well and they have a lot of energy. They're naturally sort of have a strong constitution and can accomplish things and can sort of bear hardships. So like Milarepa is an example of that, where he went off to like mountains and lived in caves and was somehow able to persevere and be joyful. Whereas other people um, so they can get like, um, you know, for me, oh, my back hurts. Oh, I'm like, you know, oh, I'm tired now. You know, like, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have this one. Uh, it's like sort of being, um, what's this is, having both a physical constitution that's not as strong and also sort of getting discouraged more, therefore. And what this is getting at in part is that um, it helps to have both, and they can go together, right? In other words, so if you have a strong physical constitution and a strong mind, that they can go together, and that having a good physical constitution where you sort of, you don't get sick easily and you have energy, uh, makes it easier also to have a mind that's enthusiastic and joyful to do things. And then when you have that combination, you can persevere in your practice effectively. And if you don't have those things, it gets in the way. Um, so then it goes into, the next section it goes into is um, explaining the karma. So now it's saying, so those things are good if you want to practice dharma. And then it's saying, now here are the causes of that. Let me say, here are the karmas to create if you want to create, have those results. So it's saying this is what to be mindful of and to do if you want to have a, like a fully, what's the word? An ideally qualified human rebirth, practice dharma, and progress on the path. So for a long life, right, it says, um, first thing it says, don't harm any sentient being. Right? Uh, and then particularly, right, because if, if we understand the teachings we've already studied a bit on karma, one is um, don't kill. Right? Obviously, if you want to have a long life, one of the karma causes of that is don't kill. And then it goes into more detail. It also says, um, don't harm. Right, so don't beat or kick or whip or throw things at others. Right? Um, then it says also um, free those, free others who are um, in danger of death. Right? And so there are like Buddhist practices like that, right? Where one goes and um, what's this is? people go to what's it called like for, in, in all Buddhist culture, in many Buddhist cultures, maybe not all, I don't know, many Buddhist cultures have practices like that, where like animals that are about to be killed, they buy them, actually, and then put them some, put them someplace safe, you know, so they can live out their natural lifespan. Right? Um, it's only the Dalai Lama does that, right? They have actual places they bring animals to, 
save them and so on. We can even do that in simple ways, though, right? If you see an insect fall in the water, and you save it and so on. Um, you know, so there are various ways to free, and yeah, you can also free something, you get the opportunity to free a human from death, right? Uh, so one is uh, freeing others from being killed, another, um, uh, yeah, stopping harm to animals. Uh, other causes of long life uh, are, um, what's the word, uh, nursing the sick, caring for those who are ill, uh, giving medicine to people who don't have medicine, um, and uh, it doesn't list it here. In, in another sutra, it also mentions um, uh, giving food and drink, like to those extend the late lifespan, like to those who are in danger of starving or something, like giving them resources. You know, so it's basically uh, helping extend the lives of others, not harming the lives of others, are the karmic causes for long life. So it's saying, um, saying that's beneficial. Then the next one was um, excellent appearance, I'll call it, or pleasing appearance or something like that. And uh, the karmic causes for that that are mentioned, one is practicing patience, okay. um, which is interesting, right? Shantideva and many teachings mention that, right? The, uh, there was, it's actually interesting, right? When we're angry, we actually create an unpleasant aspect to others, right? Like, uh, actually, if you, you know, when you, in other words, if, somebody, if somebody's angry, you feel like um, people, people and even animals, right, feel like... Um, sense of wanting to get away from that person or find their aspect unpleasant. So what they're saying is if you yourself practice patience and are gentle, uh, your, your demeanor makes others comfortable and that creates a karmic cause in future lives to have a pleasant, pleasing appearance to others. Um, other karmic causes of that are um, of pleasing appearance are offering light, like on the altar, things like that, offering lights. So actually, it could be offering lights to others who are like, you know, if there are people like in places where there's no light for studying, for children in school and so on, offering them light, but also offering lights to the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and so on, making light offerings. Um, another is building or repairing, this doesn't mention here, but in the commentary it said it, uh, building or repairing statues or holy objects um, or offering clothes, like sometimes um, I was over to that, that. So the statue in Bodh Gaya, the main statue of the Buddha in Bodh Gaya, offering like new robes, or you could offer them to the teacher. Um, then um, it says here offering. Uh, it, says, it also mentions here offering jewelry, uh, and that could mean I guess that could mean to other people, but I think particularly it's meaning like to holy objects. Um, and then uh, and then also lack of envy. And, and that one, they mentioned more, a little more in the commentary. They talk about, like, um, let's just say this, like, if you have a tendency towards jealousy or envy, working on that and not getting caught up in it. Great karma for this. Uh, the third one, having an excellent family lineage. Um, that's interesting. Because what it's, uh, this is a common teaching in Buddhism. It is, uh, one of the main karmic causes of that is humility. So to the extent that we become prideful or arrogant and put, our, and put ourselves above <coughs> others, the karmic result of that is um, not good in this sense. Uh, so being humble is one cause uh, in future, you know, so uh, overcoming your own pride. Um, other karmic causes of this are, uh, another one that says here is respecting, and here, uh, here it says respecting your gurus and others like a servant. So what it means is that... Um, Again, it's like not putting yourself above others um, and being willing to to serve others. Right? Um, and, it, and so it w they mentioned uh, your guru or your lama here because that's the most powerful karmic object, but that would include also um, acting that way towards your parents, acting that way towards friends, acting that way towards um, those who have helped you or towards teachers of yours, things like that. Like So respecting and, and being willing to uh, repay the kindness and be of service to others with humility. Actually. Um, in one text, they say uh, to have an attitude like a servant or a sweeper. So that is, is, they talk about like the mindset, the meaning like not to feel like I'm more important than other people, um, but sort of take try to have the attitude like of being like a, um, of service. Uh, then um, we're up to number four: excellent power. Right? Uh, so that one, remember, the excellent power was um, having resources and friends and followers and so on. 
Um, and so the cause of that is giving, it says here, giving food, giving clothing, and so forth to those who ask for it, and even, to, uh, even trying to benefit those uh, who have not asked. Um, right, which would include actually, just remember, I mean, that, that could include you know um, <coughs> people who ask you directly for help, right? But it could also, I mean, uh, for example, this would also include what's the word? Helping those in need, helping refugees, helping um, people who are um, who have gone through hard times and, uh, and don't have resources, you know, and whether they ask or not, uh, you know, uh, donating, helping them out uh, is, is a cause of that. Um, one commentator also mentions, um, you know, somebody who takes a job, like a social worker or an aid worker or that kind of thing, also has a lot of opportunity if they're doing it with a sincere motivation to create this kind of crime. Um, working for FEMA could be an example. Uh, and then also, um, it mentions here also uh, helping those who don't have enough. Enough. It's, it's also mentions, uh, for example, uh, where it says fields of positive qualities. What they're saying is also, uh, which actually is relevant now, right? That um, helping monks and nuns who don't have enough resources, you know, so like who are, you know, there, there are many cases like that, both actually Tibetan because they're refugees, and so on. Western monks and nuns often don't get much support. So helping those who are trying to practice Dharma to have enough resources so that they can safely and do so and have enough food and water and clothes and so on. Um, <coughs> then the one about uh, trustworthy or respected, having your words be respected, it says here the, um, the way to call, the, the karmic cause of that is abandoning the four non-virtues of speech. Right? So not lying, not um, using harsh speech, right? not uh, dividing others through your speech, not gossiping or saying meaningless, talking meaninglessly. Um, if you do, if you do those karma, if you do those a lot, then the karmic result will be that people won't respect your speech. Whereas if you are noble in your speech, in a way, right? Like um, where most of what you say is meaningful right? and either is, you know, and has purpose and is um, and is kind, then the result of that. Uh, then renowned as being very powerful, that one, right? Uh, we gave, I gave the example of like, you know, people who work hard and are respected. Um, the karmic cause of that is making aspirational prayers to accomplish all kinds of positive qualities in future lives, right? And to make offerings to the three jewels, your parents, your solitary realizers, abbots, masters, and gurus. Um, and so what that's saying is, this one's particular to Dharma practice, actually, right? So it's, what it's saying is, um, you know, if you want to have that quality of being able to accomplish um, great things for the Dharma, the cause of that is making extensive offerings, you know, making, doing the practice of making extensive offerings and then dedicating the merit towards being able to spread the Dharma and help others and do great positive actions. You know, so that's actually a Dharma practice, right? Where you might do, you know, actually at times at the center we've done that extensive like water bowl offerings or light offerings or that kind of thing. And then we'll sort of do prayers, right? And the, and the prayers might be like, may, you know, may I be able, one of the dedication prayers, right? It says like, just as the Bodhisattva Manjushri and Samantha, Bodhisattva's Manjushri and Samantha Bhadra practice, may I be able to practice like them and so on. And, um, you know, in prayers like, may I be able to accomplish deeds of virtue just like Lama Sankapa himself accomplished, or just like the Buddha accomplished. You know, so it's sort of doing extensive prayers like that after making uh, extensive offerings is a karmic cause for being able to have that quality. Um, so, oh, uh, then the one about male, uh, well, we already kind of commented on that. Um, so you can read it there. It says, um, one, one of the things they mentioned there is not, is that, what's the word? not uh, castrating animals. Then uh, number eight, to carry, uh, what's the eighth quality? Possessing strength, right? Oh, okay, that's that kind of body that, uh, and mind that are strong and that um, can naturally, you know, where you, where you have both, what's it called, what did I say, resilience, I think that's the word, or sort of a natural sense of energy and health uh, and enthusiasm. 
Um, sometimes they talk about it like uh, not, it, well, as I mentioned it here, so not harming others, not beating others, giving food and drink to others. But the most important one that I've, that most, uh, actually, that uh, is commented on a lot is taking on difficult jobs others can't and don't, or don't want to do. So in other words, the karmic, so the karmic cause of this one is basically, uh, let's just say this, either, first of all, helping people, right? But then particularly help, like we're, like, um, this, this will happen in daily life, actually, it's not a mysterious, like, where you're interacting with somebody and they're having, what's this is, they don't know how to do something or a certain task is too hard for them or it's sort of like they're feeling discouraged and you say, uh, I'll help you, I'll take it on. You know, or sometimes there's like a thing where there's a group of people and like there's a hard, a task that looks difficult and even if there's a side of you that says, oh, I don't want to do it either, um, th that's this moment. There is where you, so at the moment, so there's a moment where either you say, like, this is it. I'm not going to raise my hand, you know, or I'm not going to be no let me uh, not be noticed or something. Or there's a choice where you kind of say, I'll do that hard task. Um, and if you do it with a good motivation of saying, like, uh, you know, whatever, I want to take responsibility. I want to help others. Um, and I don't mind taking some of the burden on myself. That's the main karmic cause for having that kind of resilient, strong uh, constitution. Does that make sense? That, you know that added that moment, those kind of moments that, that would be that. Um, so yeah, I'll finish this section, then we can have questions. Uh, then it says uh, one should. Um, those are eight causes for these kind of rebirth. But then it says uh, for them to really ripen properly, uh, you should add three more things. And actually, I thought this was interesting. Again, like um, in one of the commentaries, it said when it talks about to ripen properly, right? <laughs> it says uh, it said. Um, you know, because if you do all those, like you, so you restrain from the ten non-virtuous actions, and then you do all these things. You don't kill, and you don't steal, and you, uh, you know, you help others, and you take on difficult tasks, and you're patient, and you're, you know, you help those in need. It says, if you don't do these things, which are kind of like dedication prayers, he says, one commentary said, if you don't dedicate properly, it said, then you can end up taking rebirth as like a very, what's the word, like, powerful, wealthy person but who um, then uses that to harm others even more. You know, so in other words, if you create positive karma, but you don't dedicate it to the Dharma or to something vir something that will, virtuous, that will be virtuous from lifetime to lifetime, then there's the danger of taking rebirth as somebody who has like kind of, because sometimes you see people like, who are like very resilient and strong and wealthy and have power, but use that, end up using the, those qualities in ways that are even more harmful or something. So, so we don't want that result. You know, what we're saying is like, be careful because you don't want to, you don't want to take rebirth as some. He gave the example of like a sort of, like somebody of, of great power in an outlying region who then does bad things. Um, like the child, like imagine if you took rebirth as a very power, like very healthy, strong child of a dictator, like, who's going to take over the dictatorship or something. It's not such a good rebirth. Um, so it says the the things to do to avoid that and to and to make this work out from a karmic point of view in the ideal way, uh, one is um, dedicate your virtues uh, to accomplish those causes, uh, to accomplish the causes of unsurpassed enlightenment without hoping for a fully ripened effect. So what that's saying is like, when you do virtuous actions, um, make dedication prayers, right, uh, to be able to continue practicing the Dharma and being of benefit to others. You know, so rather than... Um, Dedicating, like, you know, may I have a lot of money or strength, you know, may I be, what's the word? You know, like, let's just say this, like, don't dedicate selfishly. That's the simple way to put it, right? So you don't dedicate the merits with a self centered attitude. You dedicate it, like, may I continue to be of service to others, and may I be of more and more service to others, and may I um, accomplish Buddhahood itself, right? Um, so not with a kind of in, not, not where your dedication is sort of infected by or contaminated by um, self-centeredness. Uh, and the next one is uh, to uh, also to accomplish the causes intensely from the bottom of one's heart. Right? So that means like to do these positive actions intensively and with great sincerity. Right? So when you're doing these kind of positive actions like being patient or making offerings and so on, uh, to do it from with a sincere motivation. 
um, those who are in relation to oneself, right? How you dedicate, not to dedicate only for oneself and, and for one's own heart to do it. The next is, um, right, so to do it sincerely from the depths of your heart, not with some kind of superficial, not for appearances, for example. Then, uh, perf uh, in relation to others, it says, uh, get to give up envy, competitiveness, and scorn at the sight of the highest intermediate or least practitioners in agreement with the Dharma and to rejoice. So that one is saying, like, what's this is? Sometimes if you were practicing and then we see somebody else doing practice, like we can, um, actually, the, the danger I just mentioned, it says here, high, intermediate, and low. What it's saying is, like, sometimes we can, in relation to others who are better than us, who are doing, like, a better job, it's, it's possible we can feel envy, right? Like, oh, why, you know, they look better than me. <clears throat> and then sometimes, um, in relation to those below us, we can feel pride, actually, like, oh, I'm better than them. Uh, and in relation to those who are sort of, uh, who are on par with, we can sort of feel competitive. And this is just saying, um, all of those kind of attitudes aren't helpful. Right? And the cure to them, right, the, the way to cure, is not to like attack yourself if you have those thoughts, but it's saying the cure to those is the practice of rejoicing. Right? Right, so rather than doing that, to recognize, to say this, like, actually, and it's easier if you contemplate this way, right? Or start with the, those who aren't doing as well as myself to feel how great they're doing what they're doing. Like, they're, that's wonderful. How else will they become Buddhists? So it's really great that the person's making effort. And then, like, um, you know, towards those who are doing more, actually, it's more to rejoice in. Right? Um, and towards those who are the same, you can also rejoice, and so it, it increases uh, the positive karma. So it's saying, that no matter where, the, no matter how you're sort of comparing yourself to others, if you pause and re practice rejoicing, it'll serve as an antidote. To that. Um, and then it says, it's funny, even if you're not capable of that, to think of it many times a day as a way to act. And so it's saying, like, if you try to practice rejoicing and then, and then somewhere inside you you're still thinking, yeah, but uh, I wish I was, you know, is uh, then keep remembering and keep trying and slowly it'll improve. Um, then the uh, other, uh, pure performance in relation to itself. So it's saying uh, when practicing virtue, to do it for a long time, continuously and with great intensity. Um, that just made me remember one time I was uh, teaching by Lama Zubram a few years ago. And that one of the ones in North Carolina where he's teaching again. But um, it was really, I thought it was funny. He was saying he, he was saying thank you to people who had worked hard for MPT for like twenty or thirty or forty or maybe fifty years. And then he was saying um, it was funny. He made me laugh because then he said, "Of course, Shakyamuni Buddha did work for three countless great eons. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so forty years is like really short compared to that." And I said, "But still, forty years is a long time." So it's really good. But compared to three countless great eons. I thought that was really funny. Um, I appreciate that to you. But what it's saying is like, so, so what that's getting at is to have a long perspective, right? What Rinpoche is saying is similar to this. It's like saying, have a long perspective and think, you know, in other words, as long as I, as long as, um, as long as it's possible, right, then to do positive things um, with great intensity, continually, and, and, and not wanting, to sort of, not thinking like, oh, okay, I did a little bit of, I did a retreat, now I'm, But to have a kind of long-term perspective, so I style on the that too. Um, and then it's saying, in relation to others, what this is getting at is um, to encourage uh, positive things and especially morality in others, right? And what that's getting at is like, actually, this is true though. I would have mentioned this. This is an important practice, really, in this sense that, um, on the one hand, like, you know, it's, like it's not so helpful. Go around telling everybody what to do doesn't really work too well. Um, but you know, in other words, um, but there are things one can do. So it's saying a couple. It gives a couple of examples. It's saying when somebody is doing something good, really praising them and noting it. Like in other words, in our society, sometimes that doesn't happen, right? Like actually, negative things are sometimes get more attention than positive. And so one thing we can do in our own practice this is getting it. This is one practice we can engage in, which is a practice of bodhisattvas actually is when you see somebody doing something that's morally positive and ethical and good, is both to that person to point it out and also publicly to point out, like, like you know, how wonderful that is. Look at, look, you know, look at this example of what this person's doing. I so respect that and so on. Like, honestly, from one's heart, because two reasons. One is it encourages the person who's doing something positive, right, to keep doing it. And the other is it also points out the example, right, uh, to others. And so praising those who are doing good things is 
Um, and then others are like, um, another one is, you know, to, set a, to do our best to set a good example, being a moral person. Um, and then also where it says here, preventing them from abandoning um, things. You know, there are moments where somebody like will come, you know, comes to you for advice or for input or like wants to talk to a friend about what their decision is. And so th to me, those are moments where you have the opportunity to, to say this, like, to remind a person how to connect to their own values and to what's most important, you know, and to stay on the, and to remind somebody to stay, how they can stay on the right path and so on, uh, ethically. And so it's saying doing that is, is also important. Um, And then it said, it was a, just the two, attitude and performance produce plenty of good fruit whereby they resemble the people. So it's saying if you have a good attitude and you do these things, then the, all, these, all these positive results will naturally come about. So I'll just pause there um, and see, like, see this, so this whole section, right, was about how to, it's an interesting point, right, like how to sort of create a, uh, the karma causes so it's like how to practice Dharma in this life while creating the causes says, to continue progressing in future lives in a meaningful way and as, and as, and as powerful a way as possible. Um, that's what that, that's a, that whole section was about, right? Um, what's be any questions or reactions to that before we go on? Say, oh, I'm not sure. Say what he means. Oh. So he's saying that you know, to be male is not. Don't worry too much about it. It was a culture. It was in the cultural context, right? Is there an alternate sort of quality that that he's suggesting for that? I think the main issue. I mean, the main issue there. I mean, he, not that I saw. I mean, it, it seemed like what they were really getting at was. Um, Like, uh, so is, is whatever culture one is born in sort of, you know, being, so say it, like having a, the main issue there is having a position or a situation where, like, the, I mean, one commentator said, like, um, I don't know, you know, like, in, I guess even now, like in the, um, what's it called? Like in the, well, actually, it's true, actually, in the Himalayas. What's that? Yeah, I was I've thinking. experienced many times where if the woman says it, it's kind of, but if a man says it, it's carried small weight. So I guess it's that, maybe it's that, it's, yeah, and like having, I don't know, I mean, I sometimes wonder about this, like, uh, I mean, nowadays, I'll just, my own reflect, I've, I've thought about this one sometimes, and I, I thought, um, for sure, if I look at, um, there, there are some Tibetan women who are great practitioners, but for sure it's easier, still easier, if you're male and female in Tibetan culture now. Not that there aren't examples of great female lamas and great female practitioners, um, and you know now it is possible to become a geshe. But like the number of female geshes is uh, no, I think there are a few now. I don't know, but very few, and you know there are oh, so good. many. There's a Tibetan. A few some Tibetan speaking. Um, you know, and things like that, and uh, but it's much it's much better than it was. But it's also still not easy. And I don't know. And I mean, if I think of like, and then when I think of in the West, I mean, on the one hand, I know some amazing you know, female teachers and female practitioners who are really remarkable. So I don't think if I look at them, I have to say, well, what's they've, they've accomplished amazing things. I don't know. I mean, some women I've talked to say things like what you said, which is like, well, it's still easier. <laughs> um, but the, but the quality the itself stuff. that they're trying to get to is to be in a position of power, basically. I think what they're getting at, really, when they when they actually say it, the examples they usually give are, the examples they give in the text are, it's e it's that uh, both in India, I mean, throughout the history of, as long as Buddhism has been on the planet, for most for the most case, what they're really getting at is this: is to travel freely. To go off in the wilderness and do retreats, to have access to 
as they say, this, both to sort of to to being f feeling free to sort of go where one wants and do what one wants, um, not and, being controlled by and not be controlled by others in a sense that it's been yeah that it's been easier to be sure. male than female. And have It's true, I guess. So all yeah. of mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't feel like it's slating women in any way. I think it's stating an obvious fact. Yeah. It's an interesting question, then. I mean, one thing I, I would ask... I mean, this, again, that's why I wonder about it. It's like... Um, I mean, actually, if you look at society today, even in the West, it's still... Yeah. Have true, we had a female it? president yet? <laughs> yeah. I wasn't going to say that, but I was thinking <laughs> the same. I was starting to think about that. Well, it made me, actually made me think of Ruth Bader, there was an interview also with Ruth Bader Ginsburg, mm -hmm. where somebody said to her, how many women should there be on the Supreme Court, you know, before it's equal? And she said, all women. <laughs> and she said, nobody ever questioned when it was all men. Right. Or nobody would question when it's all men. Why shouldn't it be all women? And like, and you can see, uh, you know, it's like, oh, wow, she's right. You know, like, um, so. Yeah, I don't, I don't really feel like it's that different. Yeah, so maybe that is so still relevant. It's not saying Even in the West. if you lack these qualities, you don't stand a chance. It's just saying these eight qualities will make it easier for you. Yeah, yeah but I mean, also, it says we have a male organ, so right away, that's not what we're. What's that? Well, what it's getting at is social, but it's getting at that from a social point of view. Which is so pervasive. Um, this is the same point, Jody. Yeah. yeah. It's saying socially, what's the effect of being of gender? Yes, but even in, I mean, the Tibetans haven't changed very much. No, it's an interesting question. Like, I want to differentiate two different things. I think it's an important point. Is like, like from a, I guess I would, say, I would differentiate two different things. Like from a, this is like, um, I'm trying to say this the right way. From the point of view of opportunities in this life, the person who has more has more opportunities in certain ways sometimes because they can, you know, they can whatever, uh, they can donate and, ha and get to some place, or they can, you know, they have access to travel and to getting to things and to taking time sometimes. Or, um, and then also the person who has, so the, what, part of what this is saying is if you have more in this life, it makes it easier sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, I've noticed not always, but sometimes. Uh, there are some exceptions, I think, though. I, personally, that's not what this is getting at. What this is saying is like, is that if you have those resources and you're trying already, if you're, if you're already a practitioner who's trying to sort of help others, you know, and so on, you know, so that if you have resources, for example, this is getting at two things. One is you can access, you know, it's sort of easier to get to places and hear teachings or go do retreat or so on. And also if you're trying to help others, like, you know, there is a, there's, I think it's getting at like somebody who's like building monasteries or building schools or building um, publishing houses or things like that. That of course, if they have wealth, they can accomplish those tasks. Whereas if you don't, then it's very difficult to accomplish these outer things. So that's, that, that's one thing. But then your question about like the karmic causes that you're creating, no, that's not. And they give there's a there's actually an example from a sutra, they, um, where um, I always remember this one because I liked it, where like it was actually the Buddha himself was um, invited by a king, like a regional king, and the king sort of put on like a humongous, what's the word? Like he, the Buddha and all the like a group of monks who were with him and Nanda who probably came uh, to this like, and the king had like a palace and outside was like a big pavilion or something and so the king set up because it was like it was like oh i'm hosting the buddha you know and the buddha was already very famous and and the king set up like a humongous schmuggest <laughs> board i guess you know and like that and uh and had like decorations and all that and um 
and the king felt quite you know, proud of himself for sort of putting on such a big event. And then the, the story goes, there was like a beggar outside who was sitting like outside the fence of the pavilion area uh, who had nothing and who thought, and who was just looking and he thought, wow, he looked at the Buddha and he thought, he felt like great respect and devotion and faith in the Buddha. And he was like in his heart, like rejoicing that somebody could make offerings like that and thinking like, how wonderful, I would love to offer everything to the Buddha. And then uh, they say when the Buddha came time to dedicate, he said, um, he said, uh, great merit, he said, basically he said, great virtuous karma was created today by somebody. And I want to dedicate that great virtuous karma. And he said, the person who created the most virtu virtuous karma to dedicate today is this beggar. And he pointed to the guy sitting outside the gate. And he said, because in his heart, he felt, the Buddha had read his mind, you know, and said, he felt great faith and devotion and sincerity. And, and he said, whereas the king kind of had a little bit of arrogance going, you know, and he said, so that person created a great deal of good, so I want to dedicate his good karma to whatever, whatever you know, all these good things. Um, so, yeah, so no, having, so giving more doesn't necessarily mean you're creating more. It's the mind of the person who's giving, that's the, uh, you know, the, like, so, like, and they say that, like, in the teaching it says, a bodhisattva who, who, let's say, gives, like, five cents or something, but gives it with bodhicitta, creates more merit, even than a person who is sincere, and gives a million dollars, but but who's just thinking, may I have a good future rebirth, right? So if, if, a, if a very wealthy person gives a million dollars thinking, may I have a good future rebirth, and a bodhisattva gives a nickel saying, may all beings become Buddhas, and that's in their heart, I'm just saying it, but that's what's in their heart, the bodhisattva actually creates more merit than the millionaire or something. Like so it's, it's the main thing is the motivation. So it's two different things, though. You get that, like, there's for the karma created, it's mainly your motivation, but then this is more about the practical... If you're, you know, it's like, um, if you want to help others, these things help you to be able to do that. Yeah, any other thoughts or questions? <laughs> One last question I'll ask you guys, just because I, I won't go on to the next section today, because uh, we're almost out of time, is, um, I think it's an interesting point that Lama Tsongkhapa makes here, so I just want to mention it very briefly, because I, it's again just one I personally thought about. So. Is this point, of, like, you know, because sometimes people, I, I've talked before about self-compassion, right, and like kindness to yourself and so on, and I, I'm curious what people's reaction is, because you look at this section, right, and it's clear that Lama Tsongkhapa is talking about becoming a Buddha and be a benefit to all sentient beings, right, so it's grounded in compassion. But then he's talking about how to have the best possible life. Right? Like, what are the best circumstances? What's the best, you know, family and best... Like, he's not saying... Um, let's just say this. He's saying, how do you create the causes to be in the best of circumstances? Uh, and, he, and he's... In, and he's in, here, it's obvious that he's saying to the reader, include yourself. It's, it's, this is about you. you. You should... He's actually advising, you should... Um, in order to progress towards enlightenment, you should actually want these things, and you should create the causes of them and put effort into that. Uh, and like, if you imagine somebody for a moment who has all these qualities, right? So they're like naturally strong, and they're resilient, and they're intelligent, and they come from a good family, and they're, you know, they have, they're attractive, you know, they're good looking, and they have uh, enough stuff, and you know, they have access to whatever they like. Um, it's uh, interesting, right? Like, because I think sometimes uh, the reason I'm bringing it up is I think sometimes in the West we can have like some idea of oh no, I, like I shouldn't want anything. And actually, Buddhists particularly, right? Sometimes people say, oh, if you're Buddhist, you shouldn't want anything. Now he's not saying don't. He's not. Uh, he is saying don't dedicate this selfishly, right? That it'll, it'll actually lead to bad karma. But he's also saying having those things is good, right? If you're trying to practice Dharma. I'm just curious people's reaction for a moment, like, because it's not the attitude most people. I think many times people would feel, oh, I, like I shouldn't, I shouldn't want that for myself. <laughs> now, in one sense, you shouldn't want it for yourself, but in another sense, you should. Like, depending on how you think of for myself, mean, you know, if it's just for myself, then no. But if it's like, you know, and um, I'll mention, like, you know, there's the Shakyamuni Buddha himself, right? This is for what His Holiness was getting at. Is that he he took rebirth into the most, like, into the family of a regional king, right, 
And he had all these qualities. He was strong, he was intelligent, he was well off, he was good looking, he was whatever. Um, and if you look at like Atisha, same thing, right? He was born into there in that, not in the same area down in uh, Bengal, right? But he was like born again in a wealthy, you know, he was attractive. He was, um, and he was able to bear the hardships of traveling all over, you know, to Indonesia and all over India and like that, right? He had a strong physical constitution, obviously, and so on. Um, I don't know. How do people feel about that? Like, like this idea that that it's good for you to have what's good, you know, like good circumstances. Do you feel comfortable with that? And I guess the trick of that, I just want more comment, right? The tricky part is how to do that without also becoming prideful or arrogant or self-important. So it's just tricky, I think. But it's an interesting point. Yeah. Well, when you think you know it all, you kind of stop learning, I think. I mean, if you have a lot of pride, you think I'm great. There's no reason for me to prove I'm already great. You stop progressing. Yeah. Kind of a built in trip. Fall over something. Yeah, that's true. So I think it's, I, mean, I, I, just, I just wonder about that sometimes when I think about this. I wonder sometimes, like, uh, Sometimes I think, if you look in the world, I mean, I don't know, I don't, this is not what this teaching is saying. Sometimes I just, my own experiences, but if you look in the world, like, I say you're right. I, I think of two of them. I th actually, I sometimes, I sometimes just my own observation, I think having, there's a way where, maybe there are exceptions, but oftentimes having, particularly <laughs> being too good looking or having too much money can, seems like make people shallow. shallow and arrogant or something. Um, not always, but sometimes, you know, whereas, but, but having enough is quite helpful in a way. You know, so I don't know, I just wonder about that. It's an interesting teaching, I think. I think it's an interesting teaching. I'm just, I guess I'm just saying before we start, I, I just think this is an interesting teaching to contemplate in that way. And sort of, you know, because it's a, your own dedication prayers, right? So there is a saying, make dedication prayers for what kind of circumstances you want in a future life to practice dharma. And so it's interesting to contemplate that, right? Um, and also that, you know, I guess I'll make one last point about this, right? Because Lama Sankapa does say that, right? That you were dedicating, in order to continue our practice and help others, that you create positive karma you did. And also different people are different, right? Some people dedicate to be born in a pure land. Others dedicate to be human and serve others. Others, you know, like it depends what your dedication is. But that's what this is getting at that territory, right? So thinking about your own future lives. This is also the definition of perfect human rebirth. Yeah. Right? All the circumstances. Well, this is actually, I mean, what he says, actually, there's, or I don't know if he gets into it here, but there's another commentary that says, you know, there's a, what's it called, the precious human rebirth, right? Like, uh, that has 18 qualities. And uh, actually, one of the commentaries said this. This is in addition to the 18, right? So this would be 18 plus 8. Uh, that would well, be a lot of sort of ideal. A lot of these are the same as those, those qualities. Living in a harmonious land, I mean, there's, there's a lot of overlap. Yeah, but, like, a lot of them aren't. Like, you know, like, so... Um, you know, being powerful or having respected words or coming from a good family, those don't mention that particularly. It's, it's just it's having access to Dharma. It's, so it's, these are some of these are quite additional. It, it has the concept, the precious human rebirth, of the whole leisure and endowment where you're not just so busy scrabbling to stay alive that you can take time to. But this is going beyond that. Yeah, this is even more qualities in a way yeah. of, having, of having opportunity. It's more opportunity. Yeah. <laughs> so we feel.